Okay, hello there and welcome to this presentation on Iceland's amazing geology. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey and the purpose of this presentation is twofold. First of all, I have a small group that I'm leading to Iceland in a few weeks and so I wanted to give them uh, something to review and some material and content that would help enrich their trip to Iceland and the things that we're going to look at and the stops we're going to make while we're there. And then twofold, I wanted to also make this more widely available to folks who maybe have been to Iceland or maybe have a trip planned or are planning to visit sometime in the future, or maybe they just want to learn a little bit more about this really unique part of the earth. And so I hope that uh, no matter which uh, sort of audience you fit into that you find this interesting. Um, I've geared this presentation mainly towards uh, this group I'm taking to Iceland based on their geologic background, but I think this will also be a benefit to anyone regardless of if you have extensive geology coursework and knowledge under your belt or you're very new to geology. Uh, I will be sure to describe things in a way that you can understand and minimize the use of any any fancy terminology. So I want to first start with <clears throat> understanding I Iceland's outstanding geology. And this first slide here depicts sort of the three realms we're going to explore that really provide a foundation in understanding Iceland's, uh, its landscape, um, the reason it's even there, and really the foundational uh, concepts that govern its geology. So we'll start with, we'll look at volcanism, um, both explosive eruptions like we see here in this top left photo with the, the big billowing ash cloud, and also more effusive eruptions like this uh, eruption of fluid basaltic lava uh, that's quite tourist friendly. This is a picture I took in August of 2022 when there was an eruption in southwestern Iceland. It was quite uh, approachable. Thousands of people went and visited that eruptive site. Uh, we'll also explore volcanoes in the context of tectonics. So this bottom left photo here from Thingvellir National Park, Iceland's plate tectonic setting is quite unique and largely governs a lot of the geologic processes that we see there. And so a solid foundation in understanding the tectonic processes and the setting that it occupies is, is important for understanding Iceland and its geology. And then we'll conclude our presentation by looking at glaciers and glacial processes. And glaciers have done an absolutely exquisite job of just shaping the landscapes of Iceland. And we'll even look a, a bit into how some of these realms cross over. So for example, we'll look at how glaciers and volcanoes interact when they're trying to occupy the same space. And so let's start with our overview of Iceland's tectonic setting. <clears throat> and so Iceland, again, is somewhat unique in that it's it's sort of uh, living a double life, if you will. On one hand, Iceland is absolutely a divergent plate boundary. This is a place where um, two plates are separating. It's what we call a divergent plate boundary. Uh, the North American plate is moving to the west, while the Eurasian plate is moving to the east. Iceland sits atop the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, an underwater chain of mountains that runs through the length of the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Most of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is under the ocean, thousands of feet below the surface of the water. And so it's quite inaccessible and difficult for us to study or make any sort of observations. But Iceland is a wonderful place to look at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge because this is where we can readily observe it. It's on land and exposed. Um, and Iceland only popped up a few million years ago. It's a relatively young uh, landmass when we look at other islands or continents on planet Earth, land masses. The two plates are moving apart at a, at a, at a fairly slow rate. Um, you know, of course, these are geologic rates, but about a centimeter per year, the two plates are pulling apart. But what, of course, we have going for us here is the immensity of geologic time. So that one centimeter a year of movement can produce some really dramatic and, uh, and, and really awesome landforms given you know, thousands of years, millions of years of time. So on one hand, we have a divergent plate boundary. On the other hand, Iceland is also something we call a hotspot. So the magma that rises to the surface in Iceland <clears throat> comes from 
a fairly deep location within Earth, down in the lower part of the mantle, hundreds of kilometers down, uh, is where this magma rises towards the surface. And so much lava has erupted here in this location that Iceland is considered a, both a divergent boundary and a hotspot. Other hotspots you might be familiar with would be Hawaii or perhaps the Yellowstone hotspot here in North America. So Iceland is somewhat unique in that it, <clears throat> excuse me, represents both a divergent plate boundary and a hotspot. Um, so that's a really unique place to start our story. Let's look at uh, the volcanoes a bit here and some of the volcanic processes. Here's another map of Iceland showing that same plate boundary uh, coming up onto Iceland, onto its shores at the southwest here on the Reykjanes Peninsula, moving into the interior of Iceland and then moving off the north or northeast shores uh, and connecting back to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We'll look at some other uh, maps here in a second that explain this crossover a little bit, but it's not as simple as just a simple line cutting through Iceland. This map nicely shows, though, the location of its 30 or so active volcanoes, mainly meaning that we've got these volcanoes that have erupted either in historic times or in prehistoric times, um, but we have reason to believe that they're still, they're still active and that they might produce a future eruption. The volcano shown in red here, Fagradjalsfall, um, and I'll try to pronounce a few of these Icelandic words throughout the presentation, but I'm sure I am butchering them and not doing them justice, so I apologize. But this is the volcano that was erupting uh, in 2021 and 2022 uh, with much fanfare and lots of people, including myself, uh, flocked to Iceland to see this erupting. Most of these volcanoes here in Iceland erupt a type of material called basalt. So this would be similar to what you see in Hawaii, a uh, very fluid type of lava. It's high temperature. It's fairly runny. For the most part, it's very tourist friendly. Um, but there are other rock types and other types of volcanoes in Iceland as well. So it's much more diverse than you might think uh, at face value. But most of the eruptions do involve basaltic eruptions. And definitely most of the more frequent eruptions are basaltic in nature, this more fluid, high temperature type of lava. Um, Iceland is incredibly productive as a location for lava to erupt. Uh, as you can see here in the graphic, you know, we've got maybe about a third of the world's uh, lava that's erupted over the last 500 or so years has basically spilled out of one part of Iceland or another. So it's an incredibly volcanically active region over time as well. There's a good chance it will continue to erupt you know, every few years or so. Um, and we'll we'll spend a little bit of time looking at this volcano here, Grimsvotten, um, which most recently erupted in 2011. It's considered the most active of the volcanoes in Iceland. Here's another graphic showing a similar sort of thing, but this actually helps explain some of the concentration of volcanoes. This map does not show all the volcanoes in Iceland. It just shows a few notable ones, uh, like Grimsvotten here. Um, <clears throat> some of these other ones, but you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge coming on shore. You can see the plate boundary, and the point of this map is to see that the location of the volcanoes uh, is largely predicated and controlled by the plate tectonic setting. And so we've got a step over in the plate boundary from this zone here over to this plate boundary here, with some interesting and somewhat complicated structures that kind of tie it all together. And it's along these solid and dashed lines where we see uh, the lion's share of the volcanoes and volcanic activity in Iceland. So let's look at some specific types of volcanoes that we see in Iceland uh, to help give you some sense of some of the diversity that we see in the eruptions there. Uh, some of the most frequent types of eruptions, and the one I just saw this last year in 2022, is a type of an eruption called a fissure eruption, where we have uh, sort of a, a crack or a fracture <clears throat> through the landscape, and the, that becomes the vent for the eruption. And so uh, the eruption takes place along this fracture, hence the name fissure eruption. And mainly it erupts this very low viscosity, very runny, high temperature fluid lava that sort of pours out and forms these lava flows 
uh, surrounding the fissure. Now, the lava can shoot out of the ground a little bit here because it's driven by gases that are expanding as it gets closer to the surface. There would be gases as well coming up with this lava, but it doesn't produce much ash. It doesn't explosively fragment the lava and, and produce any sort of explosive type of behavior. So these are typically quite tourist friendly and um, benign types of eruptions. So we see a lot of fissure eruptions, especially in the southwestern part of Iceland. This is the dominant uh, type of volcano that we see there are these fissure eruptions. Sometimes though, as these fissure eruptions evolve, if they're long lasting, they won't continuously erupt along the entire crack or fracture system. Parts of it will become clogged. And over time, what can sometimes happen is the, the vent for the magma or the lava, excuse me, can take place in just one centralized region. And that's when we can get a different type of volcano called a shield volcano. So if the, if the lava is pouring out of one vent, one specific location, and that fluid hot lava is just pouring down uh, from around the vent on all sides, eventually it'll build this very broad um, dome-shaped volcano that we call a shield volcano. It's called that because it somewhat resembles what you'd see if you, if you laid a Roman warrior shield on the ground. You'd have this convex, um, broad surface or, or sort of profile view. So you can see that shield volcanoes aren't very tall. Um, this one's only a few thousand feet tall, which is actually quite large for a shield volcano, but they're incredibly broad. And so the slopes on the shield volcano are quite gentle. So these are just stacks and stacks and stacks of these fluid lava flows just piled on top of each other um, from this centralized vent here. And this is uh, taken from the uh, uh, Golfos, which is a waterfall in Iceland looking north at this volcano here. Um, <clears throat> another type of volcano we get associated with basalt are cinder cones. So now imagine that our volcano has a little bit more gas content mixed in the lava such that when it erupts it throws out chunks of lava into the air and of course those at night would be incandescently orange and red glowing pieces of rock that would cool as they fall out of the volcano and then they would fall back down around the vent and accumulate and so the type of material that's being erupted here is similar to this photo here at the top it's a piece of basalt with lots of little gas bubble holes in it we call those vesicles um, and so just piling up around the vent is this immense pile of cinder and that eventually builds up the entire volcanic edifice that we call a cinder cone. So these tend to be steep, they tend to be cone shaped, uh, they tend to just erupt once, they're what we call a monogenetic volcano. Uh, typically these things might erupt over a few days, maybe weeks, maybe up to a year or so, but then once they've expelled uh, the lava beneath them, they tend to shut down and if there's another eruption in the region it will form a, typically a new cinder cone rather than reoccupy this older one. And sometimes what we see with these volcanoes <clears throat> is uh, once the gas rich portion of the lava has been erupted, there may be a little bit of residual lava left in the system that blows out the bottom of the lava and forms an actual lava flow, but it won't come out the top, it'll actually come out the base of the cinder cone itself. So we've looked at three types of basaltic volcanoes, fissure eruptions, shield volcanoes, and cinder cones. Uh, let's switch to volcanoes that are a little bit more explosive in their behavior. And let's look at stratovolcanoes. Stratovolcanoes are maybe the more classic volcano type that most people think about when they think about a volcano. Here's Mount Hood in this lower photograph in Portland, near Portland, Oregon, forming this very uh, steep cone-shaped mountain. You can see another volcano there in the distance. I think that's Mount Rainier in Washington. Um, but these are the, the the sort of typical shapes of these stratovolcanoes, sort of steep-sided, very symmetrical for the most part, um, thousands of feet in height. So these are legitimate mountains, very large uh, features. And here's one in Iceland, not quite as steep as Mount Hood, <clears throat> but similar sort of shape. This one's called Snæfell. Um, this is um, in the west western part of Iceland, and this one's about 4,000 feet tall, <clears throat> again with these steep slopes, 
uh, a little bit of uh, snow and ice glaciers on top. And if you were to cut open one of these stratovolcanoes, you'd see that it's composed of more or less alternating layers of lava and ash and lava and ash. And that gives you a little view into the characteristics of these eruptions for these volcanoes where they <clears throat> can erupt lava flows, these thick, sticky lava flows that ooze out of the volcanic vents, but then sometimes they erupt much more explosively and produce ash-rich eruptions. So I sometimes think of these a bit as being a bipolar type of volcano, where it's, its behavior is explosive during one eruption, and it might be a lot more benign during another. Uh, another type of volcano we see are calderas. So if we have an eruption that's truly large, in fact, it's so large that the volcano empties part of its magma chamber and then collapses in on itself. So this would take place during some sort of a er large explosive eruptive phase. That collapsed area now that uh, sitting over the volcano is what we call a caldera. So they have to be usually about a mile or more in diameter. You can see this one here, the Astia caldera is about uh, three miles in diameter, occupied with some lakes. Um, so there are a few of these in Iceland as well. In America, a, a more uh, notable and familiar example might be Crater Lake in Oregon or the Yellowstone caldera uh, in Yellowstone National Park. So those are some types of volcanoes we see there. Of course, the main rock type that you see in Iceland, not the only rock type, but mainly what you see is this rock called basalt. Uh, if you are in southern Idaho or have traveled through southern Idaho, this is the dominant rock, rock type that we find in the Snake River Plain. It's typically dark gray to black. It may have these little gas bubbles in it, especially if it's near the top of the flow. These again are called vesicles. Um, and sometimes you might also see crystals in embedded in the basalt as well. We can see in this view here, there's these green, uh, somewhat glassy crystals. These are called olivine uh, that are trapped in the basalt. And that indicates that this magma sent some period of time cooling a little bit more slowly before it actually was erupted. So these crystals formed when the magma was still underground grew to be quite large, and then they were carried with the rest of the lava as it was erupted onto the surface. Sometimes you see white crystals, uh, more needle-like crystals in here that are typically uh, feldspar minerals. Um, let's look at some different types of lava flow features. And so we'll start with Pohoihoi lava. So if we have hot fluid basalt, basaltic lava erupting from a vent, <clears throat> we're going to have lava that flows very easily. If lava flows quite easily, we call that low viscosity. It's, it's the opposite um, of fluidity. So something that's um, highly fluid would be low viscosity. So these lavas are quite fluid as far as lavas go, and <clears throat> they tend to be a lot hotter. And this video here nicely depicts the behavior of Pahoehoe lava. As it's pouring out, it's high temperature, um, and it just sort of, in this case, it's filling in these depressions. Um, it can back up on itself as the outer crust is cooling and form these ropes or these sort of textured surfaces you see here. Um, but this is classic pohoihoi behavior. And you can see overall, it forms a fairly smooth surface uh, once it cools and solidifies. Um, this also nicely shows these little sort of chips of uh, glassy rock kind of popping up in, into the air. Um, watching lava is really a really cool experience. It's multi-sensory. You can feel the heat from the eruption. You can obviously see it. You can, it has, it, uh, it, you can see, you can hear these little chips of glass popping off. There's a noise and a crackling sound to it. Uh, just really exquisite experience if you ever get the chance. So as this lava actually flows downhill away from the vent, it's going to cool off and it's going to behave more sluggishly and slower because it's becoming more viscous. It's actually, excuse me, becoming a lot stickier and pastier. And this is a type of lava called a'a lava. These are both Hawaiian terms that we use to describe the uh, the behavior and the characteristics of the lava. Notice the a'a flow here is quite rubbly and rugged and jagged on top. It's moving much more slowly this is actually sped up a little bit. This is a time-lapse sequence. You can see the incandescent core in the interior of the a'a ah -ah flow, but the rest of it's this jagged, rubbly material that just sort of breaks off the front or the top and falls forward, kind of like the, it moves almost like the tread of a tank. Um, 
with the top and the bottom just kind of getting rotated on top of themselves. Um, and so these are some nice classic uh -uh flows here. And you can, again, see this jagged, rubbly, very sharp surface uh, on top. Let's look now at what happens when basaltic lava flows into or encounters water. So here we're going to see some pillow lava. And the, this little video clip was taken from scuba divers in Hawaii. So here you'll see lava that's pouring out of an undersea vent. The lava is being chilled and quenched by the cool seawater. And so it develops a little rind, but the continuous lava pressure breaks out. And what this is forming over time are these rounded, tube-shaped, sometimes oblong features. These are what we call pillow lava. So this is what it looks like when it's erupting underwater. When it completely cools and solidifies, it might look a little bit like this. So you can see these rounded profiles of these pillow lavas in some places are a little more uh, elliptical or, or oblong. In some places you can see the entire uh, tube section like we see here, sort of the, the profile or the side view of these pillow lavas. And if you could look at this up close and personal, you'd usually see that around the outside margin of the pillow lava, it's very kind of glassy because the basalt is being quenched and cooled so quickly that it has a little bit different characteristic than the interior, a little different uh, texture, if you will. So these are always on display in Iceland if you start looking in the road cuts or different cliff faces because there's been so much interaction between both the lava and either the coastline or rivers and streams or even glaciers that there's quite a few uh, pillow lavas exposed in Hawaii in various places. Um, if that let me go back one real quick. Um, so the pillow lavas will tend to form where there's sufficient water pressure on the lava to keep it from uh, becoming explosive. But if we have shallower water on top of the lava when it's interacting with the water, that's going to tend to flash that water into steam and become much more fragmental and explosive. So now as that water is heating up and turning to steam, it's blowing out chunks of lava. It's throwing them up in the air. They fall back down. Uh, and then get all glued together to form this type of rock, which is called hyaloclastite, or it's also somewhat called, I guess, like a volcanic breccia. Um, but hyaloclastite's a little bit better term because it's more specific to the lava water interaction. So here you can see chunks of rock uh, glued together. It's a hodgepodge mixture of big rocks and small rocks, all sort of shapes and sizes. Um, and then oftentimes, you get a little bit of a yellowish hue to the rock. This is a alteration product called pelagonite. So basically the glassy material uh, interacts with the water and produces this stuff called uh, pelagonite. Another really cool feature we see in Iceland, as well as other places where we have basaltic lava, are columnar joints, or sometimes this is called columnar basalt. This is the Svartafoss waterfall in Iceland, which is a really uh, famous attraction. And here what we have is lava flows, a flow of lava that is cooling uniformly. So as the lava stops moving and starts cooling, uh, it cools from the outside in, and that allows these big fractures to form that eventually link up. As the lava is cooling, it's contracting and pulling away uh, and from all sides. And that's, what the, that's how you get these six-sided hexagons that form. Um, so these, these fractures tend to be very evenly spaced, and the top view of these pillars or these columns is that they tend to form these hexagon shapes. They're not always perfect hexagons. They can be pentagons or, I guess, uh, septagons um, or heptagons. Maybe that would be the right term. Um, but what you see here is the, the columnar joints are vertical, and the photo here on the left, you see that they're actually horizontal. So let me see if I can explain how we would get different orientations there with this nice graphic that um, Chelsea McFeeney helped me put together. She's a, a geologist and a computer graphics um, expert. So in the top photo or top diagram here, we've got lava flowing over some topography, uh, some more or less horizontal land, but then flowing over this steep hillside or cliff face here. So as the lava stops moving and starts to cool, we get these cracks these fractures starting to form from the top where it's in contact with air. 
and from the bottom where it's in contact with the cooler land. So these fractures are moving into the interior of the lava flow until finally in the bottom diagram, the, the fractures have linked through the entire lava flow thickness. And sometimes those cr cracks may line up perfectly. Other times they may be offset a little bit, but either way you get these nice hexagonal pillars as the lava flow cools. And notice here the pillars or the columns are more or less horizontal because that's perpendicular to the land surface that, they, that the lava was flowing on. Whereas over here where the lava was flowing over a steeper little embankment or even a cliff, the lava will tend to be uh, more sideways or even horizontal in terms of those fracture orientations. So hopefully that helps a little bit with understanding how columnar joints uh, work and look. Some other cool features we see related to volcanoes, both in Iceland and in other places, uh, feeder dikes. So these are the conduits, the actual plumbing systems that brought the lava up to the surface and then erupted it. So here you can see on the left, this dike, this feeder dike of magma that, car that carried the magma upwards and fed this lava flow up here on top. So it's cutting across these older layers of ash, this, this beige layer here. And anytime you see a dike, it will always be younger than the rocks that it cuts. That's a fundamental rule in geology. It's called the principle of cross-cutting relationships. Uh, over here on the right with some students from a few years ago, you can see this beautiful feeder dike uh, cutting through. I think this is some hyaloclastite. This might have been some tough layers up here, but then feeding into this lava flow uh, further up the, the cliff face there. Um, let's now look a little bit at how volcanoes and glaciers uh, interact together. And this is one of the more fascinating parts of Iceland geology, at least for me. And so if we start with, let's start with this diagram at the top. If we start with ice in a glacier sitting on top of the landscape and a volcanic vent that now brings lava towards the surface, as that lava interacts the ice, the lava is of course going to melt the ice into water, but we still have the pressure of all this ice above it. And so what's gonna take place initially is the lava, because it's confined by the pressure of the ice and the water, it's gonna just produce a lot of pillow lavas. So our base, basal material here initially during this eruptive phase is going to be a lot of pillow lavas. Above the eruptive site on the surface of the glacier, we see uh, a downdropped area, what's sometimes called an ice cauldron. Basically, it's a depression in the ice with these concentric fractures around or above the vent of the volcano that lies beneath the ice. And here, this is the Grimsvotten volcano, and you can see that exact pattern here. So this is indicative of melting of the ice taking place below this point, uh, presumably because there's some volcanic activity melting the ice. The landform feature we're gonna to tend to see here, if it is a fissure eruption, we will see an elongated ridge or trend of um, pillow lavas. And so the landform feature we call this is called a tindar. These are actually Native American terms from British Columbia. And if it's more of a blob here, you'll see that in the next diagram, it's, it has a different name, it's called a, a tuya. So if it's only erupting from one vent and not a linear trend, um, it'll be a little bit different. So let's go to the next phase. What if this volcano continues to erupt? What happens to the glacier above it? Well, eventually the volcanic activity can completely melt the ice above the vent and form a little lake, a subglacial lake. Well, at this point, the lava is interacting with the water, but there's not so much water on the lava to keep it under pressure to form pillow lava. So now it becomes explosive. Now we're actually fragmenting the lava into little pieces of ash, into blocks of material. And so here's where it becomes a little bit more explosive. And in the photo here, also from Greensvolten, you can see uh, the vent, the primary vents for the volcano. You can see all the ash covering parts of the glacier. And you can see the little lake forming a bit of a moat around the vent here. And so this would produce the hyaloclastite type rock that we talked about earlier. We've got the fragmenting of the rock itself, uh, the explosive nature of the eruption uh, would form this hyaloclastite layer. And that might produ produce a, a again, a, a trend, a linear trend of material called the tindar, 
or if it's just coming through one vent, it would just be sort of this big mound here. So let's allow the eruption to play out even further. So let's go down to this bottom diagram, which, which links all three that we've looked at so far. And this comes from uh, these fine folks here in one of their publications. So now we've got a lake on the surface of the glacier. We have the volcanic material that's been produced from the subglacial eruption uh, up to the explosive phase that produced the hyaloclastite. And now as we continue to erupt more lava, now instead of interacting with the water, the water is further away. The lava is just pouring out and piling on the older deposits of hyaloclastite. And so this is just typical basalt. This is what we call subaerial basalt. Uh, so this just forms a cap of much more dense lava um, that will dense uh, material that will form the basalt cap, this lava here. And then what we end up with in terms of a landform is these tindars, these ridges that run lengthwise across the landscape because they represent fissure eruptions, but they're capped by these harder, more resistant rocks. Remember that the pillow lavas are very rubbly. There's lots of pore space in there. The hyaloclastate is a very fragmented rock type, but these basalt caps on top here are very hard and resistant to weathering. And so they are going to tend to protect, protect the landform from uh, being weathered down. And so here's a nice classic example of one of these tuyas. A tuya is a a mound feature from these subglacial eruptions. And if it's more elongated, remember we call those tindars. So here we have the pillow lavas at the base of this thing, the hyaloclastites forming the sort of second layer of the sandwich, and then this basaltic rock capping off the top. And you can see that it's definitely harder because it's forming these cliffs uh, near the top of this, this mountain here. And this is, truly is a mountain, this thing. I didn't put scale in here, but this thing's probably two to 3,000 feet tall, maybe something like um, seven to 800 meters tall, maybe 900 meters uh, in height. So these are impressively large landforms we see um, in Iceland. And there's places along the south coast where you'll just see these flat plains punctuated by these large mountains uh, that represent vents that formed underneath the ice when the glaciers were much more prevalent in Iceland. So let's wrap up our presentation by looking at glaciers in a little bit more detail. So uh, glaciers once were much more prolific across Iceland. In fact, we'll see they covered the entire uh, country. Uh, today, currently, about 10 to 11 percent of the land is covered in ice. And the largest one over here is Vatnajökull, um, which is a large ice cap. And it feeds a lot of little kind of outlet glaciers or arm tongue glaciers that come down some of these valleys. And that's why you see so many names here. These are just the names of these little tongue glaciers. But the main glacier is this one here. And there's a few other ones. So there's a large one here. So there's maybe about five large glaciers in Iceland and then a few other small ones in places. But this gives you an idea of the extent of ice in Iceland, at least currently. Um, but things were much, much different in the past. So 27,000 years ago, um, Iceland's glaciers covered an area about this big. Remember that during periods of glaciation, sea level is lower. So because we have more of Earth's water locked up as ice, that necessitates a drop in sea level. And so Iceland's coastline was further out to sea. And these glaciers probably actually extended out past the coastline for some distance offshore. And so Iceland's glaciers were once much bigger, as was some were glaciers in other places. This actually shows Northern Europe, the British Isles ice sheet that covered um, two thirds of Great Britain and Ireland uh, up to the Shetland Islands, um, the Scandinavian ice sheet that covered all the Scandinavian countries, as well as some of these um, uh, Northern Baltic state regions, Poland, Latvia, so on and so forth. And then a Siberian ice sheet uh, that extended out through this region as well. And so there's glacial evidence to, to, to support the extent of the ice uh, over these areas. So let's look a little bit at how glaciers work and behave um, so that we understand those a little bit better. So glaciers are just masses of ice flowing downhill uh, because of their sheer mass and due to gravity. And the ice at the top of the glacier tends to behave a little different than the ice at the bottom. At the top of the glacier, the ice is actually 
moving faster, but it's also more brittle, meaning it cracks um, as it tries to flow. And so what we typically see at the surface of the glaciers then are these crevasses. So as this glacier is moving, let's say from left to right, it develops these big fractures, more or less perpendicular to the flow direction. Um, near the bottom of the glacier, the pressure of the ice makes the ice behave a little bit differently. It's much more plastic, so it can somewhat deform, <clears throat> excuse me, without breaking. And that's important because at the base of the glacier, what's happening is the ice is actually pressing itself into the underlying bedrock and plucking or removing, excuse me, pieces of bedrock as it flows down slope. And this is important because this is how glaciers modify their landscapes. This is the primary way that glaciers uh, do heavy erosion on the underlying bedrock. They pick up pieces of rock from below, incorporate that rock into their icy mass, and then that glacier continues to flow downhill. And then it will continue to excavate and, and remove more rocks beneath it uh, as that glacier continues to move and progress. And it's these rock particles embedded in the ice that actually allow the ice to sculpt and shape the rocks below. And so you see here, we can see the evidence of glacial erosion, either these big polished surfaces here, this is called glacial polish, where the ice and the embedded rocks in the ice have passed over the underlying bedrock and polished the surface just through friction, or we'll see in places striations, basically uh, lines or scratch marks where the rocks embedded in the ice have moved across the face of this underlying rock and left these gouge marks, if you will, uh, in the rocks. Now in Iceland, we don't see them, at least I haven't seen them quite as beautifully preserved as here. And that's partly because the rocks in Iceland, think about what we've learned so far. We've got the pillow lava, which is somewhat kind of rubbly. We've got the hyaloclastite, which is um, fragmented rocks. And so there's typically not this nice, um, cohesive, strong underlying bedrock for the glacial polish and striations to develop in. And so that's why I chose to take some pictures from uh, other areas where there's granite underlying this previously glaciated terrain. But nonetheless, there are places in Iceland where you see uh, nice polish and striations as well, just maybe not quite as spectacular as the ones I'm showing here. Um, as the glacier melts near its terminus, um, it's obviously melting and turning that ice into water. So that water starts to flow out towards the low areas, but it's also carrying a lot of fine sediment, silts, clays, sometimes sand in these little braided stream systems. Um, and so you get a lot of sediment deposited out in these outwash plains. These are called sandurs in Icelandic and there's vast uh, plains or sandurs in the south, along the south coast of Iceland. Uh, the other thing that we see in places where a glacier reaches its furthest extent um, as it's carrying the ice, well, not just the ice, as the ice is carrying the rocks and sediment embedded in the ice, uh, as they reach their downhill location where it starts to melt, uh, all that sediment will be dropped along its margin, along the margin of the glacier. And this is, becomes what we call a moraine. So you can see the side moraines or what we call the lateral, lateral moraines here. Uh, and then the leading edge of the glacier here, which might be called the terminal moraine. The photo at the bottom left just shows you what this material is made out of. It's again, a, just a mixture of big and little rocks, anything the glacier could carry of all shapes and sizes. This is called glacial till. And that's what these moraines are made out of. Here you can also see the ring road, the main highway in Iceland, Highway 1, that sort of skirts this large moraine. Um, obviously, building your highways through the sand doors, through the outwash plains, is a lot easier uh, than building uh, roadways that go up and over uh, these moraines, which can be a couple hundred feet tall or even up to maybe 100 meters in height, depending on uh, the size of the glacier. And then finally, this is a image showing one of these large glaciers on the south coast of Iceland. So you can see the edge of it uh, here near the red and orange lines. And then, so that's where the glacier is. And then all these colors correspond to different years. 
and the retreat of the glacier over time. So you can see in 1890 with this forest green color, the glacier extended several kilometers further down the slope than where it is today. This sharp line here is actually the coastline. So this is the ocean. And you can also make out uh, the highway, the ring road down here as well. But what you can see here is the steady retreat of the glacial ice uh, over the last, I guess, you know, 130-ish years over time to its current location here. This is actually uh, one of the more famous uh, tourist destinations in Iceland. This is the Jokosalon Glacial Lake or Lagoon. And these big chunks you can see here are actually icebergs, big pieces of ice that have broken off the glacier or calved off the glacier that float around in this thing. Uh, eventually, some of them <clears throat> make it through this inlet here or this uh, outlet, and they go out to the ocean. Um, and then they sometimes wash back up on the beach, depending on the wave action. And so to end up our presentation here, I just wanted to show you one of my favorite places, which is just uh, below that glacial lake, these big chunks of glacial ice, they get brought down uh, to the ocean, pushed back up onto the black sand beach here. And this is sometimes informally called uh, Diamond Beach. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope uh, it maybe inspired you to go visit Iceland or if nothing else, given you a little better glimpse of the geologic processes and some of the, the landform features that we see there. Um, so hope you enjoyed this and thanks for joining me today.